So you already see that I won the prize for the longest title of the day, right? Um, those of you who know me at all know that I work at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. I'm Dean of International Studies and Programs. And maybe I'd be called a pastist, not a futurist, because I've had my job for 38 years. I'm in my 39th year. And it's a job in international education. And the likelihood of me having a job in international education when I started out was really closest to zilch, all right? And as it could be. And so I'm, I wound up doing what I did and what I'm doing now as a result of making a choice, making a decision that was very unlikely then and is also still unlikely for many of us today. It can affect people in their 20s, but it also in their 30s and 40s and 50s. It's when you see a chance to do something that you know might really make a major difference in your life, and you think, if I get to be 20 or 30 years older and I haven't done that, I don't want to regret not having done that, then make that choice and do it. And what I did was to join the Peace Corps. You can join anything. It doesn't have to be the Peace Corps. Uh, but you could be, you know, doing some other kind of unique thing that takes you away from the normal path of where you may have gone. For me, it would have been maybe staying and working in the family business, which I loved, or working because I grew up in Ohio for General Motors or something of that nature. I chose the Peace Corps. I learned Persian, and as a result, things really happened for me. And so, uh, I, I, it, by joining this Peace Corps, by the way, it was something I always wanted to do. My family came originally from Belgium. They were glass blowers, and at the time they came to the United States, all glass that was made was blown. And then after a while, plate glass was invented, and they didn't, they didn't. There was no need for glass blowers, so. The glass blowers had to do something else. My grandfather started a bakery. He worked in that bakery until he couldn't get goods for it during the Second World War, and he had to close it. My dad worked in that bakery with my grandfather and his brother until he went off to the war. He came back, he started his bakery. My grandfather went to work for him. My uncle went to work for my dad, and I went to work for my father at the age of eight. I was washing pots and pans, probably getting in the way more than being contributive, but each year I learned to do more things. And by the time I was 18, when I graduated from high school, I also was inducted into the Northwestern Ohio Master Pastry Bakers Association. I could decorate cakes, I could make French pastries. I loved it, and I loved that family bakery. I lived in an area that I didn't leave much. My passions, the Detroit Tigers baseball team, which tonight are playing the Yankees. I'm wearing my Detroit Tigers t-shirt underneath this white shirt here, right here, all right? And my family and friends, of course. But I wanted to do something, travel abroad, and I never was able to do that. I studied Latin, I studied French, I went to college, studied Russian, German, Spanish, and I couldn't speak any of them when I graduated. Where did I go to college? I grew up in Maumee, Ohio. There was the closest university to Maumee. It was Toledo University, seven miles away, 13 miles away, Bowling Green State University. I wanted to go away to college. I went to Bowling Green State University. <laughs> and I commuted throughout my career. I went through school, went into graduate school, became engaged. My wife and I both decided that we didn't want to have me go off working for General Motors or Ford, nothing against them, but we didn't want to buy a house then and take on a mortgage and have kids right away. We wanted to do something else. John Kennedy gave his Peace Corps speech 40 miles away in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We remembered that, 1960. And in 1964, after having gotten married, we decided we were going to go off into the Peace Corps. Now, when I went to the Peace Corps, I didn't know exactly where I wanted to go. We put down Iran, Turkey, and any place but Latin America. Nothing against Latin America, but I'm Catholic. I'm in the Western Hemisphere. 
I had to go away for two years. I figured I better go as far away as possible. Don't like warm weather. Therefore, that ruled out Latin America, Africa, India. So I'm trying to think mountains, coolness, etc. Iran, Turkey, in any place but Latin America. Of course, the Peace Corps and its wisdom sent us to Afghanistan, which fortunately had great mountains. And that's how it happened. When we went to Afghanistan in the Peace Corps, there were, for me, <laughs> the total beginning travel miles in my life. I had never left the United States. It was my very first airplane flight, 10 miles, 10,000 miles away. The unlikelihood was great, but it was because we made a decision. It was gutsy. Most of our friends thought it was gutsy. Our parents were concerned, but we went and, and we did that. So I'm going to show you some pictures now, some slides of our experience in the Peace Corps. They're not going to show us working with a lot of different you know, humanitarian programs and things like that. We did that. But I want you to see the kind of life we have. Because when you hear about Afghanistan today, you hear about a, a very troubled country, and it was. But when we were there, my wife could get on her bicycle and bicycle anywhere around town all by herself into the deepest bazaars without any concern for her security. The hospitality and everything that related to that was superb. But take a look a little bit at what we're talking This is myself and a Peace Corps friend in the compound in which we lived, okay? I'm on the right, by the way. And this is my wife and uh, that same Peace Corps friend in that same compound. There's a bunch of Peace Corps volunteers preparing their lesson plans to teach English in Afghanistan. Here I am teaching in a class in Afghanistan. I also coached the Afghan national basketball team for 10 years because when I came back from the Peace Corps two years, I went to grad school. I went back on a Fulbright fellowship to Afghanistan, and then I stayed on and I headed up the Fulbright Foundation in Afghanistan. In the end, with another year in the 90s, I uh, completed about uh, 10 years of living in that country. And uh, this particular place where you see Fellow Peace Corps volunteers, that's me in the middle. I weighed then 138 pounds. Um, I need to follow the advice of eating less. I enjoy eating too much. But in any case, um, if you read The Kite Runner, this is that uh, stadium in which people were committed, killed for committing adultery or, or being traitorous or whatever it was. And uh, this is just to show you I could walk and chew gum at the same time when I was in the Peace Corps. And even now, so that's me on the left. Um, and uh, let me see, we're not getting a movement here with the, oh, there it goes. Then this is a group of Peace Corps volunteers doing a hoot nanny for about 300 Afghan kids at an orphanage. And um, uh, we used to do those kinds of things. People in Afghanistan loved Peace Corps volunteers because they could go anywhere and they were always communicating and the Soviet Union was beaming in messages in Dari, the language of Afghanistan, the Persian of Afghanistan, that we were all handmaidens of the, uh, the CIA. But people loved to have Peace Corps teachers. They wanted to learn English. They wanted to meet young Americans. And so we're doing this hoot nanny, as it was called. We're doing dances in that. Uh, just to show you that story about myself and being a baker, the reason I'm in this picture is that one of those individuals there, uh, the young woman right here, uh, is married to a uh, Marine Corps guard and uh, the young woman is a Peace Corps, fellow Peace Corps volunteer. I baked and decorated that cake for her wedding. I also served as the father of the bride for another Peace Corps volunteer. It's not my wife. This is a Peace Corps volunteer, Sheila O'Farrell. Her father couldn't make it. So I, uh, at the Italian uh, chapel in Afghanistan, I did the Peace Corps uh, uh, father of the bride uh, stint with Afghans at the, at the wedding as well. And yes, Afghanistan had rural areas. We lived in the urban areas of Afghanistan. This was an airport built by the Soviet Union. These are two Peace Corps volunteers going home. You notice how we dressed back in those days, 1965, 66. When you took a trip, you wore a tie and a suit. Today, how different it is. Later on, as head of the Fulbright Foundation, we had a child born to us in Afghanistan. This is my eldest son, Adam. The, and yes, we used to wear pants like that back in 1963. So, so in any case, uh, this was in 1971. So in any case, and this is also on the grounds of the, uh, uh, the, uh, Af the American Embassy in Afghanistan, 
where we played ball and had a, a lot of good time. And so I'm going to now take you to this bit that I told you about earlier. And I'm going to quickly run through some things. Afghanistan is located right in the middle of, uh, of Asia here. And it uh, is a place where everything that went through the world at that time went through that particular country. And the major language on that whole artery, set of arteries of the Silk and Spice Road, and I could give a great long lecture about the reach of all that, uh, you know, was, was tremendous. But it all went through Afghanistan. And the main language from the uh, Mediterranean Sea to the Bay of Bengal, along the commercial routes, routes, the places that Alexander and Cyrus the Great and later on Genghis Khan went to. Why did they want to go there? They wanted to get the depots of the Silk Road. And so this is how they traveled. Uh, we know things came from Afghanistan. You'll see on King Tut's facial uh, representation for sarcophagus, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, the blue stone, and then uh, uh, turquoise from Iran. So this is going distances of Afghanistan being the size of Texas, Iran the size of Alaska, and another difference of size of Alaska till you get to Egypt. And all these things are moving then many, many thousands of years ago. And there was great conquerors, and we're just going to rip through them so you know their names because we don't have a, enough time to do that because I have something that I want to have you all do. I want you to learn the language that I learned. And we're going to go past Cyrus and Alexander and Bamiyan, where the Buddhas were central to Afghanistan amongst many of the major depots that were there. You know those Buddhas, they were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001, unfortunately, and now that's what that looks like. Uh, there's Afghanistan. Here are some books and articles about it that you can pick up on the slide here now from this program. And I'm going to just do this one poem for you quickly, and then we're going to learn the language. This is my favorite poem in any language. It talks about the value of friendship. It goes like this. Gili khushbui dar hamam rozi rasi das dusty mabubi badustam. Udu guftam ke mushki abari ki azbui de la wizi tu mastam. Bagoftal man gili no cheese wudum lake and mudeti bagol nashestam. Kamali ham nashin dar man o serkad waganam an amon kakem ki astam. It reads One day at Bath, a piece of perfumed clay was passed to me from the hand of a friend. I asked the clay, Are you musk or ambergris? Because your delightful scent intoxicates me. It answered, I am but a worthless piece of clay that has sat for a period with the rose. The perfection of that companion left its traces on me, who remains that same piece of earth that I was. So, beautiful language, rich Indo-European language. We're going to uh, learn that language somehow or other. I'm flipping off here to another one, so I don't know what happened to those slides. But we can do it without them. And here it is. I want you to just repeat after me, and I want the first three rows here to be my class, okay? And when I do that, I want you all to repeat. And when I hit you individually, I want you to do it individually for me, okay? So it goes like, then when I do this, it means you listen. And when I do this, you repeat, okay? So, salam. 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 Chaturastain. Chaturastain. So the word is chatur. It's got to be chacha, not sh. Because if you say chaturastain, it means you are a camel. But what I just taught you to say... <laughs> What I just taught you to say was, how are you? Huh? So, salam is hello. And chaturastain is, how are you? And when you learn chaturastain, of course, then what you want to ask somebody else or hear what you want to respond is that I'm well. That's what we do in, in English and in every language. And that goes, chubastum. 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 Salam. Salam. Chaturastain. Chaturastain. Chubastum. And then I can go on and on. I don't have that much time to do that. But here's the point. You do this by repeating and listening and repeating and listening and getting together with people. You learn this language. There's nothing like learning a language that people don't expect you to know to go to their company, country and to use that to gain a sense of confidence in yourself of being able to do just about anything you want to do for your career, for your life, for your friends, for your families. And it drove me to kind of a, identify what it is that I really wanted to do. I thought maybe I wanted to be a diplomat. I thought I maybe wanted to do 
this or that with something international. But by learning this language, by identifying with getting to have the opportunity to, to be hosted by Afghans, to work with Afghans, to teach Afghans, I knew that international education was the thing I wanted to really be engaged in for the rest of my life in terms of my profession. And that's what brought me to the University of Nebraska at Omaha in Omaha, Nebraska in 1974 and where I've been since and where I've enjoyed this whole experience largely because I took a chance when I was a Baker boy in Maumee, Ohio and left, went into the Peace Corps and learned another culture in a way that I could not have done in my classroom and as a result found something that not only engaged me, but I think engaged many others as a result. Uh, friends and, of course, I hope my students. I have so many students from Afghanistan who continue to be in touch with me, people who are now leading the country, people who are, uh, you know, uh, living elsewhere because they were driven out as refugees, but the connections are there. And always that poem remains in my mind about the value of friendships and what they can mean to all of us. And the best way to go about attaching yourselves to those opportunities is to make that choice and to go do something that you always wanted to do, but you were a little reluctant because you didn't know where it was going to take you. So there are times when faculty members in universities are given a chance to be Fulbrighters, but they don't know if they want to leave their homes. They don't know if they want to uh, go out even for a month and be away from the things that they're with all the time. Please do that. Whether you're faculty, whether you're working for Gallup in Brazil or whatever it is, these are the great things that help to make this smaller planet than we, than we think it might be, uh, be the one that we can really all together participate in its very abundant future as we were uh, told by one of our uh, previous presenters. Thank you all very much.